Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, if it hasn't been said yet, welcome to the house of the Lord on this beautiful Sunday morning. It is still morning, according to the time. <laughs> it is still morning. But it's good to see everyone today. Yeah. I, I think I'm just ready to just dive in. Amen. <laughs> Let's do it. Oh. Um, I just want to say a couple of things, but before I do, just so that I hope everybody brought their Bibles. <laughs> but if you will turn with me to the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 2. And while you're turning there, I, I, I do want to begin by saying that I, I give honor to my God. I give honor to my husband. I give honor to my pastor. Um, and I stand in submission, not just to God and the men I, I listed, but also mom. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Sister Grandma, Mimi, Bishop, I love y'all. Y'all are amazing. Um, and the Bible says to submit one to another, so... I guess I'm also, I'm standing in submission to you, to the church, to the body. I said, I guess. I mean, listen, I mean, just in case, just in case I make you numb. <laughs> um, I always want to start with that because it is a reminder to myself that I don't stand before you to bring to you my own thoughts or ideologies, my opinion, but I stand before you as simply an instrument of the Lord and hopefully a messenger of God, if I heard correctly. <laughs> and all I want to do as I stand before you today is to just bring to you what it is that God placed on my heart to bring to his people. Um, and I used to always hear preachers say, you know, as they're preaching, some, some preachers would say, ooh, I'm preaching to myself now. <laughs> like, no, you're not. You're preaching to us. <laughs> but the more that the Lord has used me, the more that I've understood that. That just because I'm standing up here delivering the word, does that not mean that this word does not apply to me. Nor does it mean that I'm standing here to tell you, you have to do this, but, you know, I'm perfect and I'm amazing and, you know, I've already done it all. So you just have to do it because I've perfected it. Absolutely not. And as a matter of fact, every single time as I'm preparing and studying, I'm just like, oh. And I was actually, I was telling my husband yesterday, I was like, you know, I was telling the Lord, I'm like, listen, if you want to just talk to me, you can talk to me. Like, you don't have to, like, have me, like, say in front of everybody. Like, I can hear you. You can talk to me in private. <laughs> the Lord always convicts me every time. But Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18, says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam and he slept and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. The title of the message today is simply this, the favor of woman. The favor of woman. 
for just a few moments while you're still standing, Bishop, if you would please lead us in prayer. And if every one of you, if you would just join in, that one more time we'll just lift our voices towards heaven and ask the Lord to just have his way. Amen. You may be seated. I'm sorry, y'all. My bad. I just want to make this formal apology. I prom- I, if I, my hand is in my pocket, I promise it's not because I'm trying to be disrespectful or rude. It's just because I don't know what else to do with my hands. So if I leave it in my pocket, I'm not going to fidget with my ring. I'm not going to, like, do crazy, you know. If I just keep it right here, it won't. <laughs> The favor of woman. Um, ah, God is so good, amen. <laughs> Pastor uh, approached me approached me about preaching today, and before he did, so I kind of just wanted to share this before I go anywhere. Um, last Sunday, well, last week, weekend. <laughs> I was reading in the book of Judges, um, and Judges is one of my favorite books. I love Genesis, and I love Judges. And in the book of Judges, I love Judges chapter 4. Can you start my timer, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I don't want to go over it. That's why I just had to make sure that was going. But I was reading in Judges, and Judges chapter 4 is one of my favorite chapters because it talks about Deborah, the prophetess Deborah, and y'all are... Uh, I appreciate me some Sister Deborah. Um, and so I believe it was like on Friday. Friday I started in Judges and made my way to about Judges 6. Or is it 7? I think 6 is when Gideon shows up. And then Saturday morning I go to read my Bible again. And I just feel like I got to start Judges all over again. Like, I'm, hey, okay, that's fine. So I start Judges over again. And I'm just like, oh, this is good. This is great. Judges is always good. And then Sunday morning before coming to church, I open my Bible again. The Lord is like, no, go back again. I'm like, what? I just read it twice. Like, you can keep going. But I did. And and I, I started reading in Judges again. And I started noticing things that I had not seen the first two times that I had read it that weekend. Um, and, uh. Well, it was specifically having to do, well, okay, a couple of things. So I already mentioned Deborah. Another woman in the book of Judges, uh, early chapters of Judges, that is mentioned is Jael, or Jael, is that how you say that? <laughs> um, and if you don't know who Jael is, well, long story short, the king was going to go to battle. He goes to Deborah. He's like, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. She's like, I'll go with you, but just know that the victory is not going to come by your hands. It's going to come at the hands of a woman. And that woman was jail. Um, I don't even know if I should tell you what jail did or just let you read it. Uh, but jail, she uh, managed to get the enemy, enemy king and uh, convinced him to come to her tent. And the Bible says that he asked for water, but she brought him milk. And as he lay down because he thought, oh, I'm, I'm good and safe here in this tent with this sweet, lovely lady, uh, she decided that she was going to take, oh, I forgot what the word is, the thing for the tent. Thank you. <laughs> tent stake and a rock. And right here. I'm sorry if that was a little too graphic. My bad. My bad. And every time I read that, I'm like, goodness, woman, (laughs) what are you doing? (laughs) And I didn't realize this. But later on in the next few chapters, we learn about Abimelech. 
And I did not know that when Abimelech went down, he went down because of a woman as well. And actually, just before he died, it was a woman that had thrown a rock, and a rock fell on his head. And just before he gave his last breath, he looked at one of his servants or one of the men that was there, and he said, hey, take your sword and just end me because I don't want it to be said that I died at the hands of a woman. And I was like, whoa, these women, the savage. <laughs> Forgive me for using that word. But I just, I thought that was just amazing. And all that morning on my way to church, like, I was, I was telling uh, Zan and my husband were in the car, and I was just, like, telling them about it. And I'm like, what is up with these women? And um, then I come to church, and pastor asks if I would preach on the favor of women. I'm like, oh, okay, so that's why you had me reread it that many times. But not only that, but... Um, Oh, I don't know if I should give it all away now. Well, it's all right. I will. During service on Sunday, as I'm, all of this is spinning in my mind and spinning in my head, I was just still dwelling on those women and, oh, my goodness. And then the Lord just said this simple thing to me and said, what those women did is what the women today should be doing. And the Lord explained this to me. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard this because, you know, when you read the Old Testament, there's so much bloodshed that happens in the Old Testament. I mean, everything was a physical battle and a physical war. And then you move into the New Testament. And it's not that the fighting has stopped. It's that now that physical fight is now a spiritual fight. The Old Testament was the... How could I say the, the physical symbol or representation of what would take place in the New Testament? And the Lord was just telling me that what those women did and how they went about <laughs> with the enemy is what the women today should be doing with the enemy spiritually. That just blew me. <laughs> Blew my mind. I was like, well, all right, Lord. <laughs> and I was excited. And I was like, okay, that's the direction that we're going. Woo, let's do this. And then as I actually sat down to study and prepare and put down everything that the Lord was downloading into my spirit for today, the Lord took me a completely different direction. I thought we were going to read in Judges, but he took me to Genesis. He took me to Genesis. And I was going to say this later, but I'll go ahead and say it now, and I'll repeat it again later. But I asked the Lord, God, why, were, why are you having me start here? Why, why aren't we just going to the fun stuff? Like, let's go talk about Deborah in jail. And the Lord said, in order for the women of God to understand, and in order for the women of God to successfully use their power, they have to understand the purpose for which it was given to them. They have to understand where to place that power. And so they have to understand how they were created. So we start in Genesis with creation in the beginning. And I hope that as, I, as we go through today that um, you don't tune me out because I'm going to say woman and woman all over again because it, it's coming. Um, yeah, no, it's coming. And it's not just, <laughs> I, I hope that we all listen very closely because I'm not just talking to the individual woman today. I'm talking to everybody in this room. I will say woman a lot, but you'll see why in the end. So Genesis chapter 2, we see the creation of woman. And, and many of us probably know and understand this story very well. That uh, in the beginning, in the days of creation, God spoke everything into existence except when it came to man. And God formed man. And when God made man, God looked at 
Adam, and he said, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a help meet. Or I would make him a help meet for him. There's a difference. And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field. Like, oh, wait, hold on, wait, 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 hold on. Wasn't Eve supposed to be the, the, the help meet for him? See, when God was looking for someone for Adam, the first thing God tried was animals. He's like, I will also, and, and notice he did not speak these animals. It says that God also formed these animals. God formed these animals and presented it to Adam, and Adam had the um, opportunity to name every creature. But then it continues, and it says in verse 20 that Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found and help meet for him. That this was the first attempt, but yet still, that was not it. And then the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he woman and brought her unto man. And Adam said, this, this is it. This is it. Yes. Bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. That, that, this, is, this is what I was longing for. And he called her a woman because she was taken out of man. And then in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 28, I just want to read that really quick. It says that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. We're still talking about the creation of woman. And from these two passages, we understand that the woman was formed after the man. That Eve was formed after Adam was made. She was made after the man. In two ways, she was made after him in time, but she was also made after him because she came from him. And, okay, okay, sorry. I got to share some of the weirdness that happens in my head. I just... I have a question. Um, no, I don't have a question. Maybe you can answer it later. But every time I read this, sometimes I wonder, because it says that God took Adam's rib and he made woman and formed woman. Like, what does that mean? Like, did he take hit Adam's rib and then put it in her rib cage? Or, like, did he take the rib and, like, draw her out? Or, like, did he, like, crumble it and then, like, took, like, everything from that one rib and, like, dispersed it in all of everything that she was? Like, what did he do with that one rib? Somebody has an answer, come see me after church. <laughs> I'm serious, by the way. <laughs> but the woman was made after the man, but don't be fooled and think that that was the only blueprint for a woman because it says that she was also made in the image of God. In fact, First and foremost, she was made in the image of God. Those things are important as we continue. So that was the creation of woman. That's how she was made, how she was formed. Wow. Now I know how pastor feels when he's up here and he looks up there. <laughs> now the role of the woman. We already read it in Genesis chapter 1, but what was the woman created for? First and foremost, the woman who was made in the image of God was created to worship God. The woman who was created in the image of God was created for God. Yeah. 
The woman who was created in the image of God was created to glorify God. The woman who was created in the image of God was created to be a reflection of God. She was made in his image. Okay, let's, let's, go, let's, let's move to the New Testament for just one moment. When you move to the New Testament and you talk about the body of Christ, the church, the church is also called what? The bride of Christ. The woman is a symbol of the church. Number two, the woman was created for the man. The only reason she came to be was because Adam said, well, actually, it doesn't say that Adam said. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm not going to put words in Adam's mouth. But God said, it is not good that man should be alone. And that's where she came from. And I want to read that passage really quick. Uh, Genesis chapter 2, starting in verse 18. I want to read it in the ESV. And it says, then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. The reason why I paused earlier is because it's important that we recognize. Okay, hold on. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that's all right. It is important that we recognize that when God made the woman, God made Adam a helper fit for him. It is important that we we recognize that when uh, God took, God took a rib from Adam to form the woman because he always intended for the woman to stand beside him. Not in front of him, not behind him, but beside him. She was always made to be beside him, to be a helper to him. Because Oh, Lord. Okay. All right. No. Nope. Calm down. Calm down. All right. <laughs> She was created for man. Um, <laughs> ah, Lord Jesus. <sighs> okay, all right, I'm going to get in trouble. I, I'm, oh. Pastor, okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay. I'm going to say it. Um, hmm, okay. All right, sorry, y'all. Woman, you were created for man. And, and, and after your purpose in serving God, your purpose is to your husband, wives, not to your children. Before your children comes your husband. Okay. All right. Let's look at Job real quick. Okay, just really quick. All right, like just, let's just like follow this rabbit trail for just a moment, and I'll be right back. Let's look at Job really quick, right? Satan comes to, to God, and he's like, hey, listen, this man, if you take everything away from him, he ain't going to worship you no more. Mm-mm. He going to ditch you. He going to deny you. He going to leave you. I don't know why I'm talking like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> to be honest, this is how I read the Bible. Like, to be very honest with you, that's how it goes in my head. Um, <laughs> anyway, and so Job gets everything taken away from him, right? And even his children are gone. And <laughs> one of the things that God told Satan in the end, he said, you have your way. Have at him, but don't touch his life. Guess what the only thing that stayed was? His wife. (laughs) Bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. I, you know, I always wondered about that. Like, God, why, why'd you leave, why'd you leave his wife? You know, everything else went, why his wife? It's because you have to understand that from the day of creation, from the day that God created man and woman, he intended for them to be one. And so when God told Satan, you can have everything, you can touch everything, but don't touch his life, that included his wife. Notice that woman was created from the rib of man, and she was created. 
from the thing that protected his heart. <laughs> because woman, that's how close we were meant to be. And part of our purpose, it's not just, <laughs> oh, Lord, help me. Come on now. All right. But she was created from his rib, the thing that protected and covered his heart. All right. Y'all let that sink in. Y'all let that sink in. <laughs> but let's continue to look at Job. Job, everything was taken away. And the thing was, in Job, at the end of his life, in Job, in Job chapter 42, you see that God blessed him twofold. He, he doubled everything that he had. In the beginning, he started with like 7,000 something. And by the end, God gave him 14,000 something. I can't remember what the something is. <laughs> he started with 500 something else, and the Lord gave him 1,000 by the end. He started with 500 or something else, and the Lord, y'all go read your Bible. I mean, I have it right here. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, and 500 she asses. There we go. That's what, that's what it was, the sums. And by the end, God doubled all of those things. But catch this. In the beginning, in Job 1, it says that Job had seven sons and three daughters. And in Job 42, it says that God also gave him seven sons and three daughters. He didn't double the children, except that he did. Job's kids were still his kids. Even if they were no longer presently with him, those were still his kids. So God gave him more kids. But also notice this. He doubled everything, but he didn't give him a second wife. All right, I'm going to just move on. Yeah, y'all just. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and here's why one is enough. Because when God was looking for a helper for Adam, he wanted a helper fit for him. Fit for him. All right, let's keep going, y'all. We're going to be here till tomorrow. All right. <laughs> the woman was created in the image of God for the glory of God. The woman was created for the man to be his help mate, to be help meet for him, fit for him. I don't know where we got help meet. Maybe we're thinking help mate, but the Bible says help meet for him, as in fit for him. All right, okay, sorry. And then number three. Okay, all right. And then number three. Created the woman in his image. We know that she was created for the man to be a help to him, to be beside him. Not in front of him, not behind him. And then we see that she was given some responsibilities and things that was expected of her. Let's look at it again in Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28. And I apologize if I reread these over and over and over again. But I'm a big believer that the word will speak for itself. So we're going to read it again, 26 to 28, really quick. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image and the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. Here we see God giving some instructions. And here's what I want to point out about that scripture. That when God started to give the responsibilities and give them responsibilities, and when God started to give them these jobs, notice that he didn't just look at Adam. Autumn? What? Okay. God didn't just look at Adam and say, hey, Adam. Now you go replenish the earth, and you go be fruitful and multiply. 
nor did he just look at Eve and say, now you go replenish the earth and you go be fruitful and multiply. But he looked at both of them and said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Because the duty, remember how I said earlier that women, the first and foremost, it's to your husband. Because the duty of raising a child was never meant for just one of you, but it was meant for both of you. You were both instructed to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. And then he continues, that was one job and responsibility and commandment that they were given. And then the Lord continues, I don't, okay, then the Lord continues, and uh, he says, and subdue it, talking about the earth. And that word subdue there means to overcome or quieten or bring under control. So he gave them both the authority to subdue the earth. And then he continues and says, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. And yet again, God gave them both dominion. He gave them both dominion. But dominion over what? Dominion over each other? It was not dominion over each other. And I think sometimes we get that twisted because we talk about submission and, um, <laughs> okay. Oh, man, I really am getting ahead of myself, but it's all right. Submission. When the instruction was given that wives submit to your husbands, that was not a ticket to enslavement, nor was it a ticket to dictatorship. Because if you keep reading your Bible, actually, in the same passage too, God instructs us to submit one to another. And here's why. Because submission is an act of humility. Submission is an act of humility. You can't have unity without humility. When the command was given to submit, God was really saying, listen, you're going to have to do this together. You're going to have to do this together together. And it's going to require some humility on your behalf. Think about it this way. Have you ever, like, tried to work in a group or a team or maybe you try to work with a, a, a partner and both of you have very different ideas? Or both of you just think, like, you have the right way? And somehow things don't get accomplished because you don't seem to agree. But there has to come a point where somebody is humble enough to say, you know what? Both of these ideas sound really good. But why don't we start this way? In any team with the greatest partnership, there is always a leader. One of you has to be humble enough to let the other lead. All right. They were both instructed to have dominion. Okay. Hmm. Is it awkward? <laughs> no, no, just Both were instructed to have dominion. And we have to understand that I mentioned before that the woman is in the image of the body of Christ and the church. And, and notice that even God himself, you know, this struck me. That even God himself, who can do all things and is all-powerful and is mighty, still chose to let his will be accomplished with the help of the church. That God doesn't, God, God who is able to do it all, he still said, no, I want a helper. That I want a help meet for me. All right. God is good, amen. 
A relationship between man and woman is a partnership. Okay, all right. I got I to gotta mention this. All right. Uh, no, keep going. <laughs> nope, I'm going to mention it. All right. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. There, I don't know why. I, okay, the, the Lord knows why. But as I was preparing, the Lord was showing me something about the, the, the whole partnership. Um, that uh, as man and woman, you're supposed to stand beside one another and, you know, you know, over time, we, we've abused that submission. You know, we've abused what it was meant when it was instructed that wives submit to your husband. And, and some people have taken it as, as an excuse, like I said before, to enslavement and to dictatorship. And that's not at all what it was meant to be, but it was to work together and accomplish what God has called us to do. And, and I thought it was so beautiful. And when I was looking at how the woman is the is a symbol of the church. I, I was thinking about when God was speaking to, um, God was going to burn down Sodom and Gomorrah. But before he did it, he talked to Adam. I, Adam, Abraham, goodness, y'all, he did not talk to Adam. To Abraham. Before he did it, he talked to Abraham. And God actually said, should I hide this thing from Abraham? And I think it's so, I, it blows my mind, y'all, for just, like, y'all think about this for just a minute. It blows my mind that even God, before he follows through with his plan, he says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to include my bride in this plan. That even God said, should I hide this thing from Abraham? And he, was, he talked to Abraham. And what did Abraham do? What did Abraham do? Abraham tried to talk to God, and Abraham began, got in the gap a little bit. Another, another one that comes to mind is when God was, he was so done with the children of Israel in the wilderness. He's like, this stiff-necked people, that's actually what it says in the Bible. He was so done with them. He's like, I'm going to destroy them. And then Moses, I'm going to just start over with you. And Moses stepped in the middle. He began to intercede. And Moses is like, Lord, hold on, think about it. Just think about it for just one moment before you do this. Hold on now. Hold on now. Just think about it for just... Woman, do you know that that's your role? Woman, do you understand that that's why you're so important? Do you understand that you have the power to influence that? And here's why God wanted me to start here. It's because we do have that power. That the woman does have that power. But unless and until the women of God understand how to use the power that they've been given and the placement to use that power. Okay, all right. Let me actually put it to, it, to you the way that the Lord put it to me. The Lord said to me, if the women of God do not learn the role in which they are to use their power, we will have many more Jezebels in the world and in the church.
I'm going to just put it plain and simple the way that the Lord gave it to me. That if the woman does not understand how to properly use her power, that we will have many more Jezebels in the world and in the church. Because here's the thing. On a Thursday, Pastor mentioned it about the four things that Jezebel does. Intimidate, dominate, manipulate, and therefore eliminate. See, <laughs> God, whew, God really has gifted the woman with this ability to, 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 to move with her words, to be convincing with her words. She really, she, <laughs> whoo. But Jezebel understood that. But when she stepped out of God's order, Jezebel understood that. And when she used it and stepped out of proper submission, it became witchcraft. Church, if we for one second think that God is going to bless us, if we try to use our gifts and our power out of alignment with him, we are mistaken. If we for one second think that we can do this without him, we are mistaken. See, Pastor touched on this as well last Sunday when he started, to, he was talking in regards to men, right? That, that unfortunately there's just this, ah, the minds of men have been polluted to think, oh, I can do this all on my own. I got this all on my own. I don't need nobody. I'm a man, right? God's the God. Pastor, I'm sorry, y'all. Pastor spoke to this on Sunday. But the thing is, it also applies to women because, whoo, there's this thing, feminist movement, there's this thing with feminism. Woo. That spirit that says that I'm a strong, independent woman who don't need no man, that spirit, let me tell you that that is a spirit of Jezebel. Let me tell you that a spirit that tries to convince you that you can accomplish anything on your own without the body is causing disunity. But if the people of God would understand this, that when God created us, he created us to be one. He created us to be united. He created us to be in harmony, to accomplish his will. If we would just understand that, that woman, listen, you do have a power. Church, listen. Oh, But don't let pride step in. Don't let pride step in and say, I can do this all on my own. Don't let pride step in and say, I don't need nobody. <laughs> because that brings disunity. And the enemy knows if I can just get them to be separated and to be divided, the mission will not be accomplished. Don't think for one second. And we can do it on our own. I wanted to <laughs> bring something up. We talked about the creation of woman and the role of a woman, what the woman was created to do. And I hope we now understand that I'm not just talking about the individual woman. Yes, I am talking to the individual woman, but I'm also talking to the church. But <laughs> I wanted to also look at this and look at what the, the woman was not created to do. Let's look at Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, after man and woman had partaken of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil and they had allowed sin to enter into the lives, then God, merciful God, who could have just done away with them and just been done with them and just killed them, he said, no, no, I have another plan. 
I'm going to let my mercy, my mercy flow. I have another plan. You can't partake of this anymore, but I do want to save you. But, but God started to kind of um, dish out <laughs> some, uh, some judgment for everybody involved. And in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. And sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Recently, I uh, happened to, because uh, the, the, the reading plan this year was an NLT, and whew, I'm telling you, our brother NLT did a number on me. But I was reading that verse in the New Living Translation. I'm going to read it to you for just one moment. And here's what it says. It says, then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy, and in pain you will give birth, and you will desire to control your husband. But he will rule over you. The desire to be controlling was never part of God's plan, but it was a product of sin. When God told them to have dominion, it was not dominion over one another. It was dominion over the earth. <laughs> I, oh, I just got to thinking about that when the Lord was showing that to me. I, I'm sorry. Personally, I get so sick and tired. I get so sick and tired of this feminist movement stuff. And here's the thing. I will be the first one to tell you that I absolutely believe <laughs> that, you, what, woo, that men and women were called alike. And God intended to use men and women alike. But this mentality, see, what, what the feminist, here's what makes me sick about it. What the feminist movement has done <laughs> And it has taken the beauty of the woman and the glory of the woman and now deified the woman. And the moment that you deify something that isn't God, you're stepping into idolatry. The moment that, the moment that you think that you're just better than everything on earth, the moment that you think I'm just all that, okay, hold on. <laughs> Okay, Woo. <laughs> when I was studying and I was looking at the different women in the Bible, <laughs> and I was looking at Esther, a queen, and <laughs> I kind of laughed, honestly, I laughed when I was studying because the words that the Lord said to me was, now that's a slay queen. We use that term, right? Slay queen. But you're not meant to slay men with your image or with your body. But the kind of queen that God created be, you to be was a woman that would be like jail and slay the enemy. The kind of queen that God has called you to be <laughs> is that you would slay like Esther, a queen who, guess what? She did do some slaying. She did it with prayer and fasting. Church, <laughs> church, we're not going to slay the enemy with pretty lights. Church, we're not going to slay the enemy because we have the best songs. Church, we're not going to slay the enemy because of how beautiful we look. Church, we're not going to slay the enemy. But when we learn to operate in the power that God has given us, and we do it with humility, and we begin to operate with prayer and fasting, and we seek the face of God on our knees, then will our giants be slain.
Jezebel. (laughs) (laughs) See, Jezebel thought (laughs) that she could put a little powder on her face. (laughs) See, now at this point, Jezebel, she's on the other side. And right, she tried to take the man of God down. And she thought that she could take him down (laughs) by putting a little powder on her face and seducing him. Saying, woo! She thought, (laughs) okay, here. (laughs) Y'all, <laughs> when Jezebel thought that she could control the situation, that's where she messed up. When Jezebel thought that she could manipulate the situation, that's where she messed up. Church, oh, Jesus, help me. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Church, there, there is a war. There is an enemy to be slain. And there is, there is a, a world, a, a lost people to be won to Christ. But if we think, if we think that we can control how that's done, we've missed it. If we ever stop asking God, Lord, how do you want it done? If we ever stop doing that, we've missed it. Church, if we ever think that the way that we're going to win the lost souls to Christ (laughs) is by just making everything pretty, (laughs) making everything pretty, Let's, let's manipulate them into the church. Let's seduce them into the church. That is not what God called us to do. Because when we start doing that, there's that spirit of Jezebel. Because when we start doing that, there's that spirit of Jezebel in operation. But I wish that as a church, I wish that as a church, I wish that as a church, I love the image of Esther. I wish that as a church, we would do what Esther did, who said, I have a title. Yes. I have authority. Yes. But ultimately, he has the power. Ultimately, it's by his spirit. It's not by my tactics. It's not by my manipulations. Oh, God has been dealing on my heart about something recently. And I just want to talk to my family for just one moment. Family, dear Pentecostals. <laughs> if we think that because we're Pentecostal, if we think because we have the truth, If we think we have the holiness, and so therefore, we got this. Don't you dare forget. Don't you dare forget. (laughs) That first and foremost, (laughs) we need God to lead us. That before we go out into this world and just flaunt, I'm a Pentecostal. (laughs) 
Does the world see the bride of Christ in you first? Does the world see the humility of the bride of Christ first? Before we go out there and think, <laughs> I have a title with the Lord. I'm holy. <laughs> Listen, the moment that you start shredding your stuff, <laughs> pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Church, 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 unity. 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 The Lord keeps bringing this back to me. And if, if I say anything wrong, Pastor, I know where my chair is. I'll go sit and I'll wait. <laughs> if I say anything, and I'm serious, if I say anything that does not align with, with the word of God, and, 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 and if I'm stepping out of line from under my pastor, if I say anything... <laughs> First, God, forgive me. But, you know, I, the story of Elijah keeps coming back to me. When Elijah ran and he fled and boo-hoo, God, I'm the only one. What did God tell him? Hold on now. So listen, I got people that ain't never bowed and need a bell that you don't know about. But Elijah was out here, boo-hoo, boo-hoo. It's all about me. And here's why I'm bringing this up. God's been dealing on me about this, with me about this. So if it's not for you, then, you know, um, sorry, we'll be almost done. Um, he's been dealing with me. But, Jorney, when you go out into that world, don't just think, I'm the only Pentecostal here. Some of the only knows God. I'm the, the only modest woman here, so I'm the only one who's serving God. God had to remind me, Jordy, sit yourself down. I've got people that have never bowed a knee to Baal that you don't know about. That's that, that pride. Be careful of that. Be careful of that. Be careful of that, Pentecostal. You're my family. You're my family, so... Listen, there is a church, <laughs> a body of God that goes, we know this, beyond these four walls. But I wonder, I wonder if sometimes we forget that. I wonder if sometimes we forget that. Oh, Lord. Y'all stand with me. <laughs> I was talking to my husband some time ago, and, and again, the Lord's just really been working. Oh, I tell you what, he revealed some stuff to me. I was like, wait, <laughs> that was there? Uh-oh. And I remember I looked at my husband. I was just weeping. I, I was asking him a lot of questions. And uh, my husband asked, are you confused? <laughs> No, baby, I'm not confused, but I, I want to know. I want to know why God called me. See, notice something. Uh, going back to Genesis for just one moment, when God looked at them and he said, <laughs> to be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Does that sound familiar? You ever read in Matthew where Jesus looked at his disciples and he says, go ye and saw the world? Preach the gospel, baptizing them, go into the world, be fruitful, the gifts of the spirit, multiply, preach the gospel, and baptize them, replenish. That's not familiar. The same commandment that God gave Adam and Eve in the beginning is the same commandment that he gave his New Testament church that he's giving to every one of us. And God's 
commandment, he said he gave us dominion over the earth, not over one another. Church? Church? Another passage in the Bible, I, I can't remember the exact specific right now, but it's in the New Testament. When uh, the disciples come to Jesus and he's like, hey, he was trying to um, cast out demons and doing all this stuff. And so we told him to stop because he wasn't following us. What did Jesus say? Leave him alone. He's not against you. They're preaching my name. So they're with you. Church? Oh, Lord, help me. Let's not let the pride of being Pentecostal get us to a place where we have a haughty spirit and think, he doesn't look like me. She doesn't look like me. So we got to tell them to stop. Here's the thing. I am not speaking and saying we can't be holy or that what we're teaching. No, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. Hold on to the truth that you have. But don't take the truth that you have and destroy another brother. Don't take the truth that you have and the revelation that you have and think that now you have dominion over one another. But let's help one another continue closer to Christ. Let's help one another continue closer to God. We were given the same command. Go ye unto, unto the world and preach the gospel. Go ye into all the world, preach the gospel. You are, do have power. Acts 1.8, you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you to be witnesses. There is a power. There is a power. You do have a power. But let's not misuse it. Let's not misuse it. Let's not misuse it. Let's not misuse it. Her job is going to the world. I don't know why I keep coming back to it. Preach that gospel, but let the anointing of the Holy Ghost flow through you. Don't go and try to preach the gospel with just your spirit of man and just your knowledge. I know all things, and so therefore... Well, let's do it in humility. As we go out and we win the lost and we slay the giants, let's slay the giants with the humility of God, the favor of woman, the favor. But it's him taught last Sunday on the favor, the grace of God. That that grace of God, that grace that God has given us is in fact that Holy Ghost. <laughs> that favor, that grace, that ability to go forth. <laughs> and the favor is in the house of the Father, in my Father's house. Don't leave the prayer room. Don't stop fasting. <laughs> and please, please, do not go out into that world. I, I keep coming back to it. I keep coming back to it. We can't defeat the demons of the world if we've got the same demons in the church. It's just not going to happen. I'm going to stop talking. 
I'm going to stop talking. I'm just going to let God do the rest of the talking for just one moment. If we would just all close our eyes. Close our eyes. If we would lift our hands and lift our voices towards heaven. The favor. The favor. God, the favor that you have given me. God, the favor that you have given us. God, help me to understand the purpose for what you have given. <laughs> I wonder if <laughs> for just a moment we will self-evaluate for just a moment. Self-evaluate for just a moment. What attitude have we been going into the world with? <laughs> What's been our mindset and our mentality <laughs> as we attempt to slay giants and as we attempt to preach the gospel and to win the world? Let's just have a moment of self-evaluation. <laughs> do we remember to do it in unity? <laughs> do we remember <laughs> to be in one mind and one accord? <laughs> And just accomplish what he called us to do. <laughs> Church, let's just lift our voices towards heaven for just one moment. We were created in the image of God. <laughs> So what we do, it should be for the glory of God. <laughs> has it been for the glory of God? <laughs> or has it been to gain a title <laughs> and say, I've been called to be a missionary. I've been called to be a preacher. I've been called to be, we've all been called to win souls. <laughs> Are we doing it unto God? <laughs> Or we're doing it for the glory of God. <laughs> 